Hello, our virtual audience. Welcome to the May 19th, 2020 version of the Westport Astronomical Society monthly meeting. Uh, thanks everybody for joining. This is our third month doing this. I think we've got most of the technical issues worked out and uh, looking forward to a really great talk tonight and uh, glad everybody's joined us. Um, I'll be turning it over to Shannon, our president, one second. Just want to let you know, uh, if you have questions during the uh, during the meeting, you're welcome to post them in the YouTube uh, chat, and uh, we'll, we'll take a read through those as we go along the way and uh, ask those uh, of our speakers, uh, since you're not able to ask us in person like it uh, usually is in the raucous that is our monthly meeting. So uh, feel free to use that, and uh, we'll be getting, turning it over now. So uh, welcome, Shannon, uh, to our meeting. Hi, everybody. Let me just share my screen here. I hope it's up now. Um, welcome to another exciting edition of sitting at home and watching us pretend that we're having a meeting. Uh, as you can see, there's nothing going on at the observatory, except for the few of us that uh, go there to take photos or do occultations. So we haven't done anything public for a while, and it'll probably be another little while before we can. Um, so just not a whole lot happening right now. Um, but hopefully there is something happening down in Virginia with Cal Powell. So I'm gonna turn it over to him and I'll stop mine and have at it, Cal. Okay, let me get on mine and share this. Okay. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another installment of Cal's Corner. And I'll get the drop in here. And you might have uh, heard that uh, Hubble celebrated its 30th anniversary recently. And so we hope that it eventually will find some intelligent life somewhere. This month, though, we'll be talking about the constellation Corvus. So Corvus is Latin for raven or crow. It is one of the 48 constellations listed by Ptolemy. And it's also known as the sail or spike of spanker. Now, for those of you who think I'm into bondage, let me just explain that a spanker is a kind of sail, and that's what it looks like. And you can see how the shape of the constellation, which is off to the right, uh, resembles that sail. And the bright dot on the upper left is Spica itself. The mythology of Corvus involves uh, Apollo, uh, who sent his servant, which is a raven, to fetch some water for him. The bird was distracted by a fig tree with some nice fruit on it, and the, the bird waited for the fruit to ripen to be able to get some. And uh, then it was late, so the raven returned with a water snake, claiming that the snake blocked the stream, and so he couldn't bring the water to Apollo. Well, Apollo saw right through this story, and with anger, he tossed the bird, Corvus, the snake, Hydra, and the cup, Crater, all into the sky, positioning the cup near the raven, but far enough away so that the bird could never get a drink from it. Corvus is visible to the south in the evening sky from March through June. And it's bordered by only three constellations, Crater, Hydra, and Virgo, the Maiden of the Spring. It is 70th in size at about 184 square degrees. And that's what it looks like on the sky map. The Alpha Star, Alpha Corvi, al -Kaiba, which is from the Arabic word for tent, is magnitude four type F star, and it happens to be only the, the only fifth brightest star in the constellation, which needs uh, some speculation that it might have been much brighter in the past for Bayer to uh, make it the alpha star in that constellation. 
<clears throat> it's a pulse, possible pulsating star due to a spectroscopic companion. Beta Corvi is named Kras. Uh, nobody can figure out why it's named that because it was applied by the Czech astronomer Antonin Bekvar and uh, no uh, source of that name is known. It's a type G giant and it is magnitude 2.65. Let's try this here. There we go. The gamma star is uh, Gina from the Arabic phrase, the right wing of the crow. It's the brightest star in Corvus, and it's actually a double magnitudes 2.6 and 10, and uh, magnitudes, uh, types B and K or M, and it's pretty close, separated about 1.1 seconds of arc. The delta star, Algarab from the Arabic rate word for crow, it's a type A star at about third magnitude. And Epsilon, also a third magnitude star, Minkar from the Arabic word for beak, it's a type K star. And Eta, that's the little N-shaped uh, character uh, next to delta, it's a type F star, magnitude 4.3, and it's been studied pretty extensively because it has not only one, but two debris disks in its star system. Double stars, Struva 1604, it's a triple star, magnitude 6.8, 10, and 8.1, types G, and the other two are types K, and the separations are 9 and 11 seconds of arc. Struva 1669 is a nice matching pair. Type F stars, magnitudes 5.8 and 5.9 at five seconds of arc separation. Burnham 920 is a double star, magnitude 6.9 and 8.2, both types F and separation by a little bit less than two seconds of arc. And South 643, named after the astronomer James South, magnitudes 7.1 and 8.2 types A, and it's a wide separation at 24 seconds of arc. Some variables. R Corvi is a long period variable, gets as bright as 6.7 and it dips down below 14. And it's a 317 day period, it's a type M star. Also a type M star is SV Corvi, it is a semi-regular variable, varies from 6.8 to 7.6 over 60 days, another type M. And RV Corvi, it's an eclipsing binary, varies from 8.6 to 9.2 over 18 hours. Types of stars are F and G. Got a couple of exoplanet stars here too, HD 103774. It's a type F star, magnitude 7.1, 181 light years distance. And it's got about a four tenths of Jupiter mass exoplanet, which is pretty hot because it's at about 700 of an astronomical unit away from the host star in a six day orbit. HD 10467 is a type K star, magnitude 7.9, 70 light years away. And it's got a two-tenths Jupiter mass exoplanet. And it's at about a quarter of an astronomical unit away from its host star in a 56-day orbit. <clears throat> Some wonderful deep sky objects to look at. NGC 4038 and 4039, also known as Caldwell 60 and 61, or ARP 244, or the antenna galaxies, or the ringtail galaxy. These are really two galaxies that are colliding. One is a spiral and one is a barred spiral. And each of them is about 10 and a half magnitude and each is about five minutes by three minutes in extent. And it'd be neat to catch this in the photographs to see if you can catch the extended tails of the galaxies. NGC 4361 is also known as the lawn sprinkler. This is a planetary nebula at magnitude 11, and it's about 45 seconds of arc in diameter. 
NGC 4027, also known as ARP 22, is a barred spiral galaxy, magnitude 11.7, and it's about three arc minutes across. NGC 4727 and 4724 is yet another pair of galaxies. This one was a spiral and lenticular duo, both about uh, magnitude 12 and 13. And again, 2.7 by 1.5 for one and about uh, one minute by half a minute for the other. And since we had a match pair of stars, we have a match pair of galaxies. NGC 4782 and 4783, elliptical galaxies, magnitudes 12.4 and 12.3, and both about two and a half by one and a half minutes in extent. There's an interesting asterism that's known as the Stargate asterism. And it's in the northern part of the constellation, a little bit uh, west, southwest of the Sombrero galaxy in Virgo. And it is a triangle within a triangle. So it's a neat uh, binocular asterism to look for. So that is my review of the constellation Corvus. And remind everybody, uh, which cartoon says, did you hear about the giant asteroid flying near Earth that looks like it's wearing a face mask? And the aliens saying, are you sure it's a safe, we're at a safe distance? So everybody be safe and see you next month. Thank you. Thank you, Cal. A uh, big round of applause from our virtual audience at home <laughs> and, and all the people that are on mute on here. So let's go back to my screen. Here. Come on. There's my screen. And up next, if I can get to it, up next is Bob, Observatory Director Bob Meadows, with a photo from back when we could do star parties. This is probably in what, 1930s, I think. <laughs> Take it away, Bob. Uh, do you want me to stop sharing screen or do you want me to just leave this up? Uh, doesn't matter, you can leave that up. All right. Okay, uh, the Wednesday public nights will probably not resume until we reach the stage where schools and libraries will open. So when we get to that stage, then we'll figure out when we're gonna open. Uh, Kevin Green has been doing asteroid occultations there's one I mentioned last month uh, on April 15th. He had a seven second hit with asteroid 238 Hypatia. And there's a graphic of it. I guess there, there were two, uh, were there two uh, people that saw it, it looks like. Okay. Uh, Rick Bria got it from Greenwich. Oh, okay. That's right. On uh, May 13th, uh, Kevin and I, uh, attempted to do an occultation with a 25 inch telescope. The star was behind the trees as seen from the dome, but was visible from the 25 inch on the lawn. Most cameras will not focus on the 25 inch unless you add a Barlow lens, which reduces the field of view. The QHY CCD camera was able to focus without a Barlow lens, which is good. Unfortunately, we could not find the star before the event time. For the next attempt, we will use the club's iPad mini with the 25, which should make finding the star easier. The all sky camera stopped working on April 11th. It turned out that the manufacturer's server had crashed and their software was transferred to a new server. To work with the new server, we, had, we needed a software update. Alex Kuhn installed the update and the all sky camera is working again. This year's Stellafane convention in Springfield, Vermont has been canceled due to the pandemic. Okay, that's all. All right, we also had a temporary issue with the 14 inch scope not connecting to the computer. Um, I don't know exactly what happened, but I went there a couple of days later and tried it and it worked fine. So, eh, who knows, it works. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I thought you fixed it. <laughs> I did, I fixed it, I guess, by using it. <laughs> Uh, so up next, let's throw it to Alex for the Treasury Report. Uh, very nice. Uh, that's, that's me in the good <laughs> old days in uh, 
the Skiji fish market in Tokyo. Um, I, I ate way more raw fish uh, than I'd like to admit there. Uh, hope to get back there again one of these days. Um, so it's, it's uh, obviously it's been quiet times. We haven't had public nights, uh, but uh, you know we are continuing to get uh, amazing support from our, our members. Uh, we have, uh, you know, even though we haven't had a public night in two months, uh, we've, we've had several new people join and uh, are continuing to get renewals. So uh, we definitely, uh, you know, are, are uh, honored uh, by the uh, support you guys have all shown us and continue to show us. And uh, as soon as we're able to open uh, comfortably, we, we will be back to showing everybody the skies and uh, helping you feel even your, your membership is worth even more than it already is. So uh, thanks so much. And uh, that's really all I have to say, uh, other than we're in, we're in good financial shape. And as uh, we're able to start you know, working towards new installations, we're, we're ready to start doing groundbreaking as, as soon as we can. So, yeah, amazingly, we've also sold some calendars in the past few weeks. So if anybody wants uh, some dartboard targets to <laughs> abuse, 2020 is a good year to put up for a dartboard target. Um, you know, plus, you know, they're just good pictures if anybody just wants to look at stuff and we'll, we'll let them go super cheap. And moving on to photos. This is Dr. Stephen Labkoff's uh, M82. I think he took this one from the 14 inch. He doesn't get as much time on there as he'd like, but he's got some time coming up. Uh, this one's M5. I think he got this one with his scope, which is a 92 millimeter. And this is one that he put together from multiple nights after I showed him how to do it. This is M33 with about four hours of integration time. And during the meteor shower, I believe it was the Lyrids in April, he set up a time lapse to catch the meteors from our lawn. And we didn't see any, which doesn't sound like a whole lot of people did. Uh, he got one plane, which is unusual all by itself, because usually we see three or four planes at any given time, but there's so little air traffic that the skies are empty. So you can see one little plane trailing through there and that's it. Uh, he, uh, Stephen Lapkoff got a brief amount of time on the 14 inch with the Sunflower Galaxy here. It's not many frames, but still kind of cool. And he got a new camera that he's been experimenting with. This is Markarian's chain off his 80, uh, 92 millimeter telescope uh, with a ZWO 183C camera. Uh, he and I both went to New London to catch the full moon behind the New London light. And we were there in plenty of time, but unfortunately the app we were using, in fact, a couple different apps, showed the lighthouse about half a mile from where it actually was. So we were lined up in completely the wrong place and couldn't get it. So this is a composite because we drove all that way and just completely blew it. And there's another one. I mean, the moon actually does look like this. It's kind of squashed and fuzzy, but unfortunately we could not get them lined up. And Dana Weisbrot sent some flashes uh, back to the past. Um, this is some photos when he was little playing an astronaut. And he's been taking some great photos. He doesn't get many opportunities, but this is M101 and M81 and 82, which turned out really nice. And of course, I go out every chance I can get. That's my M5 off the 14 inch. Uh, I got some weird vertical noise that I couldn't quite get rid of, uh, but really neat globular. M101 which completely fills the frame. This one's not cropped and you can see a little bit of noise around the edges just because it's not cropped because the frames don't totally overlap, but great detail. Uh, this is just 66 frames, I think, uh, at 90 seconds each. And I went back and was waiting for the Draco Trio and it was behind a tree. So I spent about 45 minutes taking pictures of the moon. This is a two frame mosaic, uh, waiting for the 
target that I was after to clear the trees. And then when I went back to it, I realized I had the wrong NGC number and it was never in the trees. So, oops, there it is, Draco Trio. Um, if I hadn't wasted 45 minutes, I'd have more frames on it, but that's what I got. Another short session. Um, this is a little tiny pair of connected galaxies called ARC-271, uh, also in Virgo. Uh, nifty little uh, connection between the two there, but it's hard to get them big enough to show a lot of detail, and this wasn't a lot of frames either. Franco, as usually, sent a fantastic prominence photo. This one's from May 2nd with his Solar Max 90 single stack. Um, he was trying to get a animation, but I don't think he got it put together in time, but really cool prominence there. Upcoming events, not a whole lot. Picnic's canceled, we'll still do a lecture of some sort, have some kind of speaker, we'll still do lections. Uh, Cherry Springs was canceled. Stella Fang canceled. Uh, we have a summer field day with the ham radio guys that's going to be outside in tents, all spaced apart, and they're going to try and do something there. Um, Bob Meadows' Stella Fang report also canceled since there's no cell phone to report on. We'll have, again, some kind of speaker. And as far as I know, Black Forest Star Party is still on for September. And we don't know yet on the Connecticut start party. Upcoming astronomical events, not much. Really just nothing happening. Uh, right now, the Swan Comet has passed into the Northern Hemisphere. So you can see it just over the horizon if you can get a clear view to the south. Um, there's another comet that's approaching M82 that's going to be within the same field on the 22nd. So expect rain there. And otherwise, just not a whole lot going on, which is a good thing because it would be worse if there was cool stuff to see and we were closed. So I guess we can take that as good news. And up next, our guest speaker, Tomer Yavitz, uh, to talk about stellar streams. And I'm going to turn this off and turn it over to him. Awesome. Thank you uh, very much. Uh... I'm a little humbled by all the pictures you showed because I was going to show some cool pictures of galaxies, but they're not nearly as nice as uh, some of the ones that you you just put up there. So um, this will be fun. Um, let me just quickly share my screen. Get, get us started here. And you can hopefully see what I am showing. Coming through, guys. It? Yes. Thumbs up. Yeah, awesome. Good. Great stuff. Um, well, so um, what I wanted to talk to you about today is uh, seeing in the dark. Um, this is uh, really uh, a, a talk about that I, I'll weave through uh, some history, some physics, uh, a few pretty pictures of galaxies, a few pretty pictures of globular clusters. Uh, but really, really the, what I want to talk about today is, is the reason that I got into uh, astronomy in the first place uh, and the reason I am so excited about it um, and so excited to be spending my life studying it. Um, Great, so I am Tomer Yavitz. I am a, a third year graduate student uh, in the Department of Astronomy um, at Columbia University. Uh, I am a, uh, well, I like to think of myself as a theoretical uh, astrophysicist. So I was actually very excited uh, to get the invite uh, to come to an observatory. It's not something that us theorists do very often. Um, and unfortunately, uh, you know, the world had other plans, but uh, you know, I guess that gives me more incentive to uh, keep everybody interested here. Uh, so thank you all for joining remotely uh, from where you are. I will do my best to uh, make this an enjoyable time. Uh, and hopefully uh, when this is all over, I'll, I'll even get a chance to come visit, uh, given that I'm in New York, so I'm not that far away from, from you guys on a regular basis. Super. Um, okay, I'm just gonna turn off my video to make sure that uh, sound quality remains good. Um, 
Good. So we're going to talk about seeing in the dark uh, and what stellar streams can tell us about dark matter. I'm going to talk about dark matter and stellar streams. So if you don't know what those are, uh, you'll hear you'll have an earful of them. Uh, if you do know what those are, I will hopefully towards the end of this get to my own research, uh, which I expect not many of you have heard about, uh, but I do think is very exciting. Great. Um, OK, before uh, we talk about anything related to stars, uh, Really, my job is, oh, I, I say seeing in the dark or seeing dark matter, really my job is to try to see gravity. Um, and seeing gravity is, you know, we feel gravity perhaps and, and on a daily basis when, when we stumble and fall or all that stuff. Um, but seeing it is not necessarily that easy. Uh, but there are some very good examples even uh, in our own world of ways that you can actually kind of see or experience uh, the, a vision uh, that tells you a lot about gravity. And one great example is something that looks like this coin uh, wishing well. And uh, I imagine many of you have had the wonderful experience of uh, kind of dropping a coin where it says coin here and seeing the coin spiral all the way until the little black hole in the bottom sucks it in and you never see it again, just like black holes do uh, in space. Um, so yeah, so hopefully you've seen this. Uh, in case you haven't, I actually have a quick video here to show. Uh, this is uh, courtesy of um, uh, of, of Science North Museum of Ontario, uh, where they do some great demonstrations with these uh, with, with these wishing wells. Uh, so hopefully this isn't too choppy on the on the streaming. Uh, but you can see, you know, you've got this wonderful uh, wonderful funnel, and you can drop balls, and they all uh, circle circle around until they uh, get sucked into the very bottom here. Um, and you know, why am I so excited about this? Because basically, this is what uh, this is what stars in uh, well, stars, planets, everything does in our universe uh, when it is orbiting another body. Uh, so one great example of that is our own solar system. So here you have um, an artist impression uh, of our solar system where essentially the same thing is going on as what was going on in that uh, in that well, except that instead of the very middle of the well, uh, you have the sun. And instead of the sides of the basin, you have the sun's gravitational field um, kind of pulling everything. Uh, and because everything has its own velocity, everything ends up going uh, in circles. Um, one very important difference between the coin wishing well and our solar system uh, is that in the coin wishing well, it takes the coin several uh, revolutions around the black hole in the middle to fall into the middle. Fortunately, we're not in any danger of falling into the sun anytime soon. Um, because, well, fortunately for us in the solar system, uh, there's much less friction, much less drag. Fortunately, for whoever collects the jar at the bottom of the wishing well, there is some drag, so they get all those coins uh, quite quickly. But except for that, it's actually a really, I find it at least to be a really good analogy, uh, because essentially what the coin wishing well is, uh, is a a gravitational field. It creates a field on its edges, depending on how curved uh, every point of that wishing well is. Uh, and so when you're looking at the coins or the balls going around that wishing well, what you're actually seeing is the effect of how gravity, how strongly gravity is pulling uh, in, given the initial speed that each coin had. And as it gets closer, you know, depending, of course, on the shape of the funnel, as it gets closer, typically the things move around faster. And that's exactly kind of, you know, it's a good, a good equivalence to our solar system uh, where, where, you know, the, the Mercury, for example, revolves around the sun much, much faster than the Earth. Uh, many more, many more, more revolutions per uh, per time period compared to the Earth and vice versa for the planets that are further away takes them much longer to complete a single revolution. So that's great. Uh, and I should say the solar system is a relatively simple version uh, of a coin wishing well because the vast majority of the mass in the solar system uh, is concentrated right at the very middle in the sun. Um, this is typically where I do my little question and answer, you know, guess how much mass out of the solar system is in the sun. Uh, really, it's, it's over, it's almost 99.9% .9 of, um, of, of the mass of the entire solar system is all concentrated uh, in the very middle, uh, which means it's very easy to calculate what the gravitational field is everywhere, uh, because we just have really one point mass in the very middle uh, to take into account. But um, these same considerations are true uh, for bigger things. Uh, and you can really imagine much bigger things uh, in the same way uh, as that coin wishing well. So for example, we can go to something the scale of several tens or hundreds of billions of star -like stars like a galaxy. 
in the same way, this is uh, its own, it creates its own gravitational field. It is its own wishing well. Of course, it's a little harder to model this because the mass is distributed starting in the middle, going all the way out. Um, but again, the same thing, everything is going in circles uh, because there's there's a force pulling pulling towards the middle and they all have their initial velocity. So just like those coins in the wishing well, everything turns. And of course, you know this because you all have seen many, many galaxies. This is even true, we can go even bigger. Um, so uh, again, here would be a great question and answer if you, if you guys recognize um, what this is on the right, this is this is the Coma Cluster, um, one of the biggest uh, galaxy clusters um, that we are able to observe in Coma Berenices. Um, it's got over, I mean, you can't quite see all of them here, but it's got over 1,000 uh, individual galaxies, kind of the size of the one on the left, um, all kind of ro revolving around each other, all all pulling at each other uh, and and binding each other together into this large object. Uh, that we call a galaxy cluster. Uh, and again, same thing, just like the coins, you can imagine instead of each of these galaxies, you have a little ball that's rolling rolling around that, that little wishing well um, and telling you a lot about the shape of the gravitational field in which these galaxies all sit. Phenomenal. Um, so why am I telling you this? Well, the, the, the story of what I want to tell today and the story of dark matter really begins with, or one, one of the places it begins is with uh, this coma cluster. Um, it also starts with a person who is very near and dear to my heart in terms of uh, his impact on astrophysics. Uh, this is uh, Fritz Zwicky, um, a very famous, very important uh, Swiss astrophysicist uh, who worked most of his life in Caltech. Um, really one of the most impressive idea idea people, uh, I think, that, that graced the field of astrophysics. He's credited with uh, coming up with a bunch of topics that we are all familiar with and we all think of as really important. Uh, so, you know, some examples are, aside from dark matter, which I will talk about today, uh, he came up with the idea of what is a neutron star. Uh, he was one of the first people to think about what is a supernova uh, and how does that how does that happen? What, is it, what does it cause? Uh, he's also the first person to posit the idea that you could have something like a gravitational lens, so a large galaxy that acts as a lens and bends the light behind it. Um, really, a, a bunch of ideas and a bunch of different uh, subfields uh, of astrophysics. I, had, I, I pulled some great quotes about him um, uh, from, from a, a, a piece that was written about him by a fellow named Marr. Um, uh, so, for example, uh, when researchers talk about neutron stars, dark matter, and gravitational lenses, they all start the same way. Uh, Zwicky noticed this problem in the 1930s, and back then nobody else listened. Um, so, as one of these ideas people, he was he was often not kind of uh, taken too seriously. It was hard to know when when his ideas uh, meant something. Uh, in this case, uh, really, we think this idea meant a lot, and in fact, I think it's created careers uh, for many many astrophysicists like myself. Um, this idea of dark matter and what it is uh, and, and, and how, how do we observe it. Okay, good. So let's dive into the story that starts with uh, Fritz Zwicky uh, and the Coma Cluster. Um, galaxies and galaxy clusters were, were a new thing. Uh, so this is, this is I, I have a paper here from 1937 that he wrote. He actually started um, studying the Coma Cluster back in the late 1920s and wrote his first paper on it, I think in 1929 or 1933. Um, they were, so galaxies were an exciting thing because only recently had uh, the world uh, and the, the astronomical community come to terms with the idea that galaxies are a thing. Um, even uh, as late as 1920, the great debate uh, of, of astrophysics uh, had been uh, between two astronomers arguing uh, uh, whether or not these nebulae that, that were observed uh, were things that were outside of our own galaxy, the Milky Way, or whether they were just, uh, you know, small clouds or or fringe groups of, groups of stars that weren't nearly as big as uh, the Milky Way itself, which could have been uh, the extent of the universe at the time. Of course, we now know the Milky Way is just one of many, many, many uh, galaxies, and that all these nebulae, or many of the nebulae that were observed uh, back then, turn out to be just as big, if not bigger, than the Milky Way itself. Okay, so. Um, New, new topic, very exciting. Uh, in this paper, uh, or actually in the 1933 paper, uh, Zwicky starts by doing something relatively simple, which is he takes, he looks at the coma cluster, he makes a little map of them. So you can see, I don't, I can't quite match a dot to a galaxy in the picture before here, uh, but you can imagine this is a map 
uh, of the coma cluster. And the other thing he does is he measure, measures the redshift of each galaxy, essentially giving him how fast uh, each galaxy is moving either away or towards him. Uh, and from that, he, has, he can make some sort of an estimate of how things are moving uh, in this picture. Uh, assuming, again, he's assuming that things are kind of moving randomly. Nothing is preferentially moving towards or away from him. So if he knows the speed or the velocity towards or away, he can figure out what the average velocity is in any direction, making that relatively simple assumption. And the other thing he's doing here is actually he's thinking in a very similar way to that coin wishing well that we showed. Basically, it's as if you're looking from the top at a coin wishing well. Uh, he knows the velocities, he knows the positions of every star. It's sort of like he got a snapshot of a bunch of coins kind of spinning around uh, in this uh, wishing well. Very good. Um, so uh, what does he want to do? He wants to study the gravitational field. You know, we have a theory. We think that gravity is the main thing that's causing these things to move around. Uh, we know how much stuff is there, we think, because we see how much light is coming out of it. So we turn back to our, our good old friend Newton, uh, and we can calculate what the velocity of one of these uh, galaxy clusters should be, assuming that it's moving in a circle around kind of the middle um, uh, so, you know, choose, choose the, ga the galaxy cluster right here. Hopefully you can, guys can see my mouse. Um, choose the galaxy right here. It's presumably moving in something that looks like a circle. Maybe that circle is tilted towards us or away from us. Um, we, we, can, we can take a guess. That's okay because there's a lot. So statistically, we're going to get the right answer. Um, and we can calculate based on all the galaxies that are interior to this one galaxy, how fast it's moving, assuming it's moving in a circle. Uh, and and making some assumption about the mass inside. And the way they made this assumption was to say, well, we know approximately, we know the weight of a, the, the mass of a star, uh, and we know approximately how far these things are away from us, and we know how bright they are. So if we know how bright it is, we can estimate how massive it is, um, and then we can calculate the entire mass in here. So we can calculate the mass. We know how far it is away because we measure the separation. Uh, so we can figure out uh, how fast it's moving in a circle. Great. Uh, it turns out uh, the velocity that he measured was much, much, much bigger than the velocity that he calculated, uh, essentially meaning that he expected the, the galaxy to be moving at a certain velocity. In fact, it's moving many, many times faster, uh, tens to hundreds of times faster, actually, than his calculation. Uh, he then did a similar calculation of the escape velocity. Uh, so if um, instead of imagining the coins kind of uh, going in a circle in the wishing well. The escape velocity means you just give the coin just enough velocity to you know, leap over the edge of the wishing well and fall on the other side. You rescue the coin from the jar in the middle. Uh, that would be the escape velocity. He calculated what that should be. That's still much, much, much smaller than the velocities he calculated for each of these galaxies uh, revolving, which is a problem. Basically means, uh, well, there's various ways that you can interpret that. Um, so. Our friends, Vicky, the first thing he thinks, well, maybe everything is this, maybe this is a galaxy cluster that was born and is in the process of dispersing, right? Everything is flying apart. And if we looked in a million years from now or a billion years from now, everything would be very, very far uh, away from um, this, this initial starting point. But that doesn't really check out because when we look at other galaxies that aren't part of a cluster, none of them have the speed, the velocities that the galaxies in this cluster have. So. It, maybe this is the first galaxy cluster that's disrupted this way, but that seems pretty unlikely. Um, another option is maybe we just got lucky. Maybe these galaxies are all moving past each other and we just happen to catch them all kind of flying at the point where they're all very, very close to each other. Uh, but statistically, that argument also doesn't make sense because there's no other example of um, groupings like this of galaxies that aren't moving this fast. All the clusters that were observed, so Coma uh, and a few, a few others at the time, uh, were, had these huge velocities. So really, really a question. Um, what, what could we, where could we have gone wrong? Where in our calculation, perhaps, um, did we assume something that we shouldn't have assumed? That's his question. Um, so of course, we said it's very easy to follow you know, our friend Newton and calculate how fast these galaxies should be moving given uh, the mass that's enclosed uh, inside this circle. Well, the radius is kind of hard to argue against because we know more or less how far this is and we can calculate the separation and it takes just a very small bit of trigonometry to figure out uh, what the separation is. So that's R. Um, G is just Newton's gravitational constant. Um, 
well, we, we, we trust our friend Newton. Don't want don't to go against Newton. That never that doesn't usually work out well unless your name is Albert Einstein. Um, we're left with M, mass. Well, we calculated the mass using a relatively simple assumption. Uh, we know approximately how massive stars are. Uh, we know that from because we know the sun and we know um, the sun's gravitational pull again. It's very that was that was calculated many, many centuries before uh, Tzviki was around. Um, so we say, you know, we know how bright this, the sun is. We then therefore we have some sort of a relation between brightness and mass. Well, if that's the only thing that could be wrong, um, Tzviki says, if, if, if this would be confirmed, so if this finding of uh, the velocities that I calculated would be confirmed, we, we would get the surprising result that dark matter is present in much greater amount than luminous matter. And that's a fairly simple statement, right? That's just to say, these galaxies that we see, we assume their mass is all the luminous mass, but maybe there's a bunch of mass that we just can't see, and therefore it's also there, it's dark, um, and it's adding a much larger uh, portion of mass to the luminous matter's mass. Uh, and when I say much larger, I mean this was, this was by a factor by his calculation, by a factor of, uh, I think, several thousand. Uh, we now have toned that down a little bit, but certainly a factor of 10 to 100 greater uh, dark matter uh, than luminous matter. And I should say, dark matter at the time, he did not envision something necessarily very radical. Dark matter could be anything that doesn't shine in its own way at the time uh, in the 1930s, uh, because the only thing that we could see in the 1930s was really optical light. Uh, all of our telescopes were in the optical. We had not yet gotten to the uh, point of observing in radio and various other uh, wavelengths uh, like we do now. So really what he's saying here is perhaps these galaxies have a lot of, let's say, planets that we can't see or uh, dust or gas um, that is making up this portion of dark matter, uh, which is kind of supplementing the luminous matter and allowing us to revise our calculation from before to get a much larger estimate for our circular velocity. Great. So he says it's just a matter of what is what is the matter that we can see and what is the matter that we can't see. Uh, and basically this, whether he meant it or not, uh, serves as kind of a starting gun for both the observational and the theoretical community uh, of astrophysics to go figure out what in the world is going on. Uh, for the observational, um, uh, for the observational uh, physicists and astrophysicists, uh, the idea was, okay, first of all, can we confirm this finding uh, with other clusters of galaxies, with other galaxies perhaps? Um, and perhaps can we also find a way to observe this dark matter, find it so that we can uh, finally resolve this question? Uh, and then for the theorists, the question was, okay, come up with ideas for what this dark matter could be, uh, and let's find ways to observe it if we don't happen across it, uh, because the observers uh, have some stroke of brilliance, uh, and find a way to uh, see something that we couldn't see before. Well, let's start with the observational debate. Uh, the observational debate went on for uh, several decades after uh, Tzviki made his first discovery, uh, but slowly and surely um, we found more and more evidence that what he saw was indeed uh, what was going on everywhere. Uh, and the person who uh, I've typically heard is credited with ending this debate is another uh, really huge um, figure in the field. This is Vera Rubin, um, who worked uh, on, on a variety of observational uh, questions, but really her main, her main uh, uh, contribution, I think, was uh, studying how galaxies move and what we call the rotation curves uh, of galaxies. And in the 80s, she basically came up with an argument that essentially laid, um, laid to rest the question of whether or not we can believe Zwicky, coming up with, with, with a statement that basically, yes, what Zwicky saw is ubiquitous. The idea that there is more dark matter than luminous matter in these galaxies and galaxy clusters seems to be the case, not just in the coma cluster, but really in every cluster and in almost every single galaxy uh, that we observe. And how did she do this? Um, well, what she did is, as I said, she measured rotation curves. So she took an unassuming galaxy. So I've just given an example here of a, a nice spiral galaxy. This is NGC uh, 2683, otherwise known as the UFO galaxy. Uh, and what she does is she looks at, um, at the redshift and the blue shift of how uh, this galaxy is moving. You can imagine this galaxy is kind of all moving in a circle. Um, again, we've got our nice little wishing well. Uh, everything is moving around the very middle. Uh, and she can measure how fast uh, things are moving either towards her or away from her because of the redshift of each, or the redshift or the blue shift of each star. And, and what she does is she uh, essentially draws a rotation curve. 
Um, so she basically plots, don't, don't, don't pay attention to the lines yet, she plots on a scale of you know, the distance from the center of the galaxy, what is the velocity uh, that she measures based on the redshift. Now, uh, important to say, she, she, she measured this way further out than where we kind of see most of the luminous matter end at the end of the disk here. She actually went uh, considerably further um, measuring out to, uh, you know, for example, in our galaxy, something like 30 or 40 kiloparsecs uh, away where our disk ends at around uh, 15 or 20 kiloparsecs. So she went well beyond because she could find a few kind of straggler stars or, or bodies that she could measure the redshift of way out there. Now, what is the expectation? The expectation is that as you kind of leave the edge of the disk of this galaxy, that's where the luminous matter ends. The expectation is that because we can again measure the circular velocity, we can we can estimate the circular velocity uh, based on Newton. Uh, we would expect that when the mass kind of stays constant and your radius continues to grow, uh, this number should get smaller. Your your circular velocity uh, should get smaller and smaller. So you would expect something that looks like the dotted line curve A. Surprisingly, uh, what she measured was actually something that looked like curve B, um, meaning that uh, while your radius continues to get bigger, your mass also continues to get bigger, even when you no longer see uh, many or any stars really uh, going out to these much further radii from the center of the galaxy. And she didn't do this just for one galaxy. She did this for many, many, many galaxies. You see here a bunch of what we call flat rotation curves. Um, Idea being, again, she measures out to your 40, 50, 60 kiloparsecs away from the center of the galaxy. Uh, and even though the luminous matter in the galaxy ends at around 10 or 20, um, I'm pointing to the wrong screen here, uh, the luminous matter ends at around 10 or 20, uh, the, the rotation curve remains flat, meaning that there's more and more mass even further as you go out. And how do we interpret this? Well, we interpret this to say is, the luminous part of the galaxy kind of sits here in the middle and there's this huge amount of dark matter uh, around it that as you keep going out kind of your mass increases and increases. Now of course we can't see this dark matter uh, but we believe it's there because all of our theories tell us it must be there. Uh, the stuff that we see in you know the few stars that we can measure out way out in the halo are moving uh, so fast that they must be moving under the influence uh, of something else that is not just the luminous matter or the stars uh, in this galaxy. So we call this uh, the dark matter halo of a galaxy. Uh, in fact, uh, this is not to scale. The dark matter halo probably extends much further for a typical galaxy than what I've shown here. Uh, it probably would go out to the end of my page uh, and even further. Um, our, 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 our understanding of it is essentially if you take, for example, the Milky Way and Andromeda, uh, our dark matter halos are almost are so big that they're almost touching each other. They're, they essentially, one ends where the other begins. So we're talking about a huge, huge distance that this dark matter halo extends. Great, so that's that's the observational side. We, we, we must have this dark matter halo because uh, what we observe in terms of the velocities and the locations of these stars uh, suggests that the only way to explain them uh, is that we have this extra mass. But what's it made out of, right? We, we, we see something that we completely don't understand. That's where physicists get excited because that means that either something is wrong or we don't understand something. Uh, we've got to do some uh, investigative work. And that's what both observers and theorists were working on at the same time, kind of starting from uh, Zwicky's um, uh, starting, starting bell or starting gun um, back in the 1930s. Well, what could dark matter be? Well, um, as I said, it could be planets. Planets don't shine by themselves. So unless you have a star nearby, uh, you wouldn't see a planet. Uh, perhaps there's just a ton of kind of Jupiters that are cold and not, not shining uh, with their own light hanging out past the edge um, of the galaxy. That is not true. I'm going to just I'm just going to spoil it for you right now. Uh, there's no reason to believe that there are so many planets. In fact, we we have many reasons to know that there actually aren't that many planets kind of hanging out uh, in the middle of space. Uh, for example, one is that uh, by now we would have captured and seen uh, another planet probably coming through our solar system, uh, and not just some uh, a, a little a, a little a small little asteroid from 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 um, outside our solar system. We would have seen kind of Jupiter's flying around um, in our solar system, maybe perhaps getting caught by the sun on occasion. That doesn't happen, can't be planets. What else? Well, maybe it could be dust or gas, um, except that between the 30s and the 80s, 
uh, we started looking in other parts of the spectrum, not just optical light, uh, which allows us to see uh, some of this stuff. So when, you, for example, when you have um, an infrared telescope, uh, you can actually see uh, things like dust and gas uh, radiating, radiating in the infrared, and you can calculate how much uh, of that there is. You can also see uh, emission lines from various um, atomic level transitions within uh, various particles. Uh, so we can actually now see where there is gas uh, and dust, and we can estimate how much mass is uh, in gas and dust in a galaxy, and that's not nearly enough either to make up for the, uh, for the missing amount. Maybe it's black holes, right? Black holes are black. They don't emit any light. In fact, they, they collect light. This, this black hole actually does emit light. This is the supermassive black hole um, in the middle of M87 that was just recently uh, observed by the Event Horizon Telescope. Uh, big, big, big New York Times uh, uh, cover picture, first picture of a black hole. Uh, we also know of not supermassive black holes, but regular black holes that form as a result of at the end of a large star's life. Um, but we can estimate how many of those black holes exist. Um, and again, that is not nearly enough to justify the amount of dark matter that Zwicky theorized and Vera Rubin claimed to have been able to observe given her rotation curves. And we can keep going through the list. The, the, the bottom line is nothing that we really know of um, can make up for this enormous missing amount of mass. And again, I emphasize this missing amount of mass is some, somewhere like 10 times or even 100 times uh, for various objects greater than all the stuff that we know exists. Uh, nowadays, we like to say that um, with the makeup of the universe, uh, baryons are atoms and you and me and stars and gas and dust and uh, all this stuff that we can see. That makes up about three or four percent of the overall universe. Uh, dark matter makes up 26 percent, so that's way more than the baryons. And then there's this other thing called dark energy, which is a topic for another conversation, uh, which I'm not going to address today. But uh, bottom line, much more dark matter than luminous matter. And so the bottom line is, you know, there's got to be something else out there. Maybe it's a new type of particle, um, a dark matter particle, which is unlike any of the particles that we currently know to exist. Um, but perhaps it exists and we, we just aren't able to see it because it doesn't interact uh, with electromagnetic um, waves. Therefore, it doesn't emit or absorb light. Well, there's various theories for what this particle could be uh, and various th those theories each predict a certain way of detecting that kind of a particle. And here you're seeing a picture of um, a laboratory that's buried deep, deep, deep in, in the ground in South Dakota. Um, uh, and in, in this in this vat kind of that you see kind of suspended here in the middle uh, is a, is a, is a bunch of liquid that that we ex we hope will uh, one of these dark matter particles will kind of collide with and and we'll see some sort of a reaction in there uh, and then we'll be able to measure that's by the way how uh, we for the that, that's how neutrinos were detected for the first time we know that neutrinos exist because we saw these kinds of interactions in these labs deep underground so we're hoping maybe uh, this dark matter particle we'll do the same and we'll be able to detect it. Bottom line is a lot of money has been poured into these experiments uh, over the past, I think now four decades, uh, and we are still have not seen a single result. So we still have not found a good candidate for what dark matter could be. But that does not mean we give up. Uh, on the contrary, we're just more emboldened because this means something very exciting is going on, right? We see something that we, our theories all indicate must be there but we just have no idea what it could be or what it is. Uh, so again, we don't, we don't stop there. Uh, what theorists, uh, what many theorists do is they say, okay, let's, let's start with what we know. We know that this stuff we believe interacts gravitationally, right? We know that it interacts gravitationally because of these, uh, exper these observations that Zwicky made and Vera Rubin made and all the others made uh, to say that there's much more gravity uh, in a galaxy than we could, than, 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 than the stars that we see. Um, so let's assume that that's, that's all there is. And let's say that there's a particle that creates that, uh, that a massive particle that creates that kind of gravity. Uh, and if that's the only way it interacts, we can simulate it because if it creates gravity that stars and, uh, and galaxies feel, then surely it should feel its own gravity as well. So we can model what the behavior of such a particle would be. Uh, and in fact, what you see here is a very, very large simulation uh, of the universe, essentially. Uh, or, but this is not the universe that we can see. This is a simulation of a universe in which dark matter uh, exists. We, we, we think this might be our universe, uh, but we, of course, can't see that dark matter. But here we're tracking what we think the dark matter would do 
over a long period of time evolving in a universe like ours. So these simulations are done, big supercomputers. Um, where, so you, you can see the scale here, uh, 30 megaparsecs, that's, that's a very large separation, right? 100 megaparsecs is a separation between us and the Coma cluster. So you're seeing a large swath of, uh, uh, of you know, this would, this would hold many, many galaxies um, if this were uh, a true swath of the universe. Uh, and what you're seeing here is the dark matter kind of interacting gravitationally, uh, creating these clumps that are all bound by gravity. You again can imagine this is sort of like a big wishing well. Everything is kind of moving around. Uh, you've got a, a, a large chunk cluster that's fallen into the middle here and is attracting other stuff. Um, so kind of the, the analogy and what we would see if this were true uh, is each of these kind of bright spots out, out on the sides uh, would probably be home to a single galaxy. Uh, and then these larger knots in the middle would be where we'd have huge clusters like the Coma cluster. Um, of course, these clusters are sitting inside these huge dark matter halos. And you can see these halos, according to the simulation, are connected by what we call uh, a cosmic web of dark matter. Again, this cosmic web is formed just because we've put in an assumption into the simulation, which is that dark matter feels gravity, uh, creates gravity, and acts according to that gravity. Um, I should say a quick word here because uh, this is typically the question I get at this point, which is, it seems like I've created a little fantasy world and not me. The astro astrophysical world has created uh, something of a fantasy here in order to uh, make sure that our theory works, right? Our theory predicts um, that there needs to be more mass in our galaxies and in our galaxy clusters to explain what we observe. Um, we haven't been able to find what that mass is. So we've said, well, let's imagine that it still is there uh, and simulate the universe as if that's true. Seems like a bit of a stretch. Uh, and it is, it's, it's fair to say that, you know, we've kind of invented this concept of dark matter to put a patch on our theory. Um, kind of a, 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 a just a, a, a lesson from history of science is that we humans are very uh, slow to get rid of theories, especially theories that generally work very well. The theory in question here is, is Newton and by extension Einstein, uh, so me uh, Newton's mechanics, Einstein general relativity, uh, all predict that this stuff should exist. Um, so if we want to say our theory is wrong, we're really kind of wiping the slate on on, 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 on theories that have gotten us to where we are that we really strongly believe in. And th those theories, th theories like that don't change very often in the history of mankind, right? We had Aristotelian physics uh, for a very long time. Then Newton came along and came up with his own version of physics, which we then, that was a good enough theory to, to replace Aristotle's physics. And then Einstein came along and, and came up with an improvement on Newton's physics. But really, those are the only three um, theories of physics that, that relate at least to the way things move uh, and dynamics and, and kinematics. Um, and so it's very hard for uh, people to kind of get rid of such good theories. So we will go, for, we astrophysicists, I'm saying, we'll do a lot to patch up our theories until there's really no way to salvage them. And really what we're trying to do here is, is, is convince ourselves that yes, this stuff can exist. And are there ways that we can go about um, really finding more evidence for this dark matter, rather than saying, okay, this dark matter doesn't exist, we need, we can scrap our theories. Um, and we need to come up with something completely different and radical and new. So we're not there yet. We're still trying to patch our existing theories. Uh, and there are actually various, there are many reasons to, to take heart and, and to be encouraged about this idea of dark matter uh, because these simulations that you see here, um, we put in some very basic assumptions uh, and they actually end up um, solving for many things that we see in the universe without having kind of, without, without having baked that into the simulation to begin with, uh, they actually come up with predictions that work out against what we see. So that, that's very encouraging. Um, and what we do now, a, a large part of my job is to say, let's keep looking for these predictions that we can get from theory uh, and see if they pan out uh, in observations in the universe uh, to really convince ourselves in the world that dark matter is a thing and that we should keep looking for it rather than saying we're gonna give up on Newton uh, and Einstein because they must have been wrong. So that's why we are creating this fantasy. Um, back to the discussion. Uh, the current predictions that, that at least I am very interested in is um, we believe this dark matter exists. Uh, and there are two things that, that we can certainly look for now in our own galaxy uh, if our galaxy has 
a lot of dark matter in it. So one of them is what we call substructure. Uh, as you can see at this very, very large scale on the top here, you've got all these knots and all these clusters of uh, dark matter, but even on much smaller scales, um, so this is the scale of some a galaxy like the Milky Way, uh, it's not like it's a smooth uh, distribution of dark matter. The, there's these clumps flying around. It's a pretty violent picture uh, of what's going on here, of course, we can't see any of this because it's all dark matter, uh, but this is what we believe is going on. So that's one prediction that we're looking at. Uh, you know, can we find some sort of an indication for this really messy and, and clumpy structure uh, of dark matter? Two is that um, actually it's you, you can look at kind of the the clumps of dark matter uh, in the simulation, uh, and they're not all spherical. We we generally expect things to behave nice uh, and spherically in our universe, uh, but in reality, at least in the simulation, uh, we have dark matter clumps that are oblate, uh, or that this one's oblate or prolate. So you know, imagine this is an Advil. Um, this is. Uh, What's a, this is a NyQuil, this is an Advil, uh, and even things that are a triaxial so that each axis uh, is elongated or squashed in a different way. So this is like a Tylenol. Here we go, three, three different pills um, to, uh, to simulate what, what shapes we think these galaxies or these dark matter halos might take. So what can we do to discover um, whether these things actually pan out in our universe? Uh, so these are testable these are testable predictions. Let's see if we can go and find these things. Back to our wishing well. Uh, and here, here I want to do just a little thought experiment. So in this wishing well is very smooth. It's a beautifully shiny metallic surface. Uh, and it's perfectly round, which actually is a great model for something that has a spherical um, mass distribution. But imagine what happened if I filled this, um, this spherical thing with a bunch of divots, small holes or bumps uh, throughout. What would happen to the coins or the little balls that we'd ro roll around then? That is, that is a great analogy for this substructure, right? The substructure means there's actually stuff spread out all around here that's, got, that's causing little gravitational wobbles everywhere. So that's one. And two, imagine if we squashed this. Imagine if we made it uh, into a, a much more um, squashed version of it with one axis being very long and the other axis being short. You could imagine that the path that the coins would take or the orbits uh, that we'd have would be radically different in that case than they are if this thing is very round. Um, and, and what we want to do really uh, is um, imagine that we could see many, many, many balls rolling around as this person's about to throw a hundred little marbles into his um, into his wishing well. Of course, this is again a, a very spherical and smooth wishing well. Uh, and you can see that uh, you get this beautiful distribution and after a while it will actually look sort of like what a galaxy looks like. You can imagine looking at it from the top uh, and kind of pausing a snapshot here. You know, this is more or less what uh, what is happening in a galaxy, right? Everything is moving around. And now you ask yourself, would this look any different um, if we shaped our wishing well differently, or if we added all these little interferences and substructure into this wishing well? The answer is, is yes. I mean, it would be much easier to see it if we actually had a movie of our galaxy moving around like this, because you'd see the, the balls kind of jumping up and down, or we'd see them create a much more ovular shape, perhaps. Um, but you can imagine that even from a snapshot, uh, we can uh, we, we, we can get, get a picture of what's going on. Uh, we're very fortunate to be living in a time of amazing data and amazing observations. So this is the Gaia satellite, um, a satellite launched by the European Space Agency. Um, and it has a very simple and straightforward task, uh, but one that has really revolutionized my world as somebody who studies our own Milky Way. Uh, what this satellite does is it measures to a very high level of accuracy, the positions and the velocities of stars in our galaxy. So basically it's creating a very, very accurate map of where exactly where every single star is. Uh, it's, made, it's got positions and velocities for now, uh, I think over a billion stars. It's a huge amount of stars given that our galaxy has several tens or hundreds of billions. It's a good portion of the stars in our galaxy, uh, which is wonderful because this actually gives us that snapshot uh, that, that I, you know, when I pause the video of the wishing well on the last slide, it's giving us that snapshot of where every star is, which direction it's moving. Um, and in theory, we can try to infer from that what is going on uh, in, in the wishing well that is our galaxy. There are two uh, unfortunate problems though. Uh, the first is that we wanted to study um, 
the dark matter halo. We're interested in what's going on, especially out here. I mean, there's dark matter also in the very middle of the galaxy, but it's out here that it's, it's out in the outskirts and the halo that we can really kind of isolate the effects of dark matter to luminous matter. And the unfortunate thing is that all the stars are concentrated in the middle. Um, so it's kind of hard to find a, a lot of stars to study out uh, in the galaxy. It's sort of like imagining you've got your wishing well, but all your balls are at the very, very middle of the wishing well. And you don't have a lot of balls on the outside to measure kind of the structure and the shape of what's going on out here. Uh, the other problem, as you can probably imagine, is time. Uh, it would be so wonderful to get a video, a movie of our galaxy and the stars moving around the middle um, and interacting gravitationally with the dark matter. Uh, but that would take many, many uh, hundreds of millions, if not billions of years to do. We don't have that kind of time. All we get is one snapshot uh, or a very, very short uh, series of uh, snapshots that really don't give us any motion or movement of the stars in our galaxy. But I'm still here. Uh, I'm still, my job is still, still, still in astrophysics, so there must be a workaround, you're saying, and you're right. Um, and we turn to uh, the saving grace, I like to think, of this whole story, which is globular clusters. And you, uh, we saw some great pictures of globulars um, before um, that you guys have been taking. Um, so here is a globular cluster. This is NGC 362. Um, globular clusters are like, uh, well, there they're, they're, they're are large collections of stars, but they're much, much smaller uh, than galaxies. They're also uh, collections of stars that we believe don't have any dark matter associated with them. So really, you can understand a globular cluster just by looking at where uh, all of the stars are. Um, why are they great? Well, they, they come with two added benefits. One is, well, globular clusters tend to hang out further away from the galaxy than the stars. So here, I'm just imagine I'm placing this globular cluster around a different galaxy. This is actually a globular cluster around the Milky Way. But um, we have globular clusters that kind of uh, uh, are scattered throughout and further out in the dark matter halo uh, then we have, uh, say, the disk of a galaxy, which is great. That, that gives us one of the things we wanted, which is kind of points uh, further out uh, in the dark matter halo, points out, uh, out, out in the outskirts here. Um, that's one thing. But even more interestingly is that these globular clusters, um, as they as they as they as they move around the galaxy, they're feeling the the tug of a much larger gravitational field coming from the galaxy itself. Uh, and that, just like um, in, in smaller scale uh, uh, stellar physics, uh, causes tidal disruption. Uh, essentially, it, what the galaxy is doing is it's slowly tearing apart um, a globular cluster like this. Uh, and it tears it apart by really, instead of tearing, when, when, we, when, when, when I've typically heard of tidal disruption, or at least when I was uh, an undergrad, we thought of tidal disruption as what happens when, let's say, a star goes by a black hole, and the black hole slowly pulls uh, the material from the star and, and eats it up. Um, and here what's happening is instead of that, uh, the galaxy is, is picking one or two stars um, f away from this globular cluster and, and, and basically just putting it on a slightly different orbit, but unbinding it from the globular cluster itself. Um, so it's slowly pulling these stars away. And what that ends up looking like is this stellar stream here. So you, your globular cluster, because it gets shredded by the galaxy, uh, slowly the stars essentially trace out the orbit of the globular cluster itself with, a f with, with some stars on a leading arm, uh, kind of moving ahead of the globular cluster, and some stars on a trailing arm moving behind it. This is an actual picture uh, of not a globular cluster, but a dwarf galaxy uh, that's being shredded by a larger galaxy. Um, why is that so great? Why am I so excited about this? Well, because that gives us actually a snapshot uh, of what uh, of a time-based event. Um, so let's actually see a movie of this. This is just a, a simple animation uh, that I make of what what a what a how what is the formation of a stellar stream look like? So you can see the globular cluster started out here. Uh, the galaxy you can imagine is kind of right in the middle here, and the gray line here is the path that the globular cluster takes. And you can see that as this thing evolves, the stars are getting shredded and pulled further and further away from the original globular cluster, which is kind of in the middle of this, um, of this, uh, of this evolving stream. Uh, so the stars are really getting pulled into a leading and a trailing arm. So after just a few orbits, instead of having one kind of very dense clump of stars uh, where this blue guy uh, started out, you have this really long spread out stream of stars. Uh, and that's really fantastic for us because it means uh, that we can actually see 
physics kind of happening, uh, we, we can see these tidal disruption events uh, and we, we, we know exactly how they happen. Uh, so we can then model backwards in time. And if you remember, I said the main issue is that we, have a, we only have a snapshot, but these streams, and this is actually a, a picture of a bunch of real streams uh, around our own galaxy, tell us how our galaxy is shredding apart uh, these streams. What this means, so essentially, if we started out with the idea that our galaxy is this wishing well in which all these coins are moving around, uh, these globular clusters are special coins. They're leaving a trail ahead and behind themselves. Uh, and so you can see actually where they've been and where they've gone, wh where they're going. And you can see how the stars that were stripped off, uh, what, what path they followed uh, instead of actually staying with the cluster itself. And we can use that to actually predict and say, well, if, if, the, if, the, if the wishing well were exactly spherical and it had no interference or substructure, our stream would look one way. But you can imagine that if our, if our well had all these pockmarks and, and divots, then the stream would look very different, right? You have stars scattered in different directions instead of uh, staying on a very uh, thin stream. And so I want to wrap this up with sh showing just a few shots uh, of, of current research of the stuff that I'm working on, the stuff that my collaborators are working on, uh, to try and really find what this dark matter is and where it is, uh, and whether we can actually corroborate these, um, these predictions uh, from simulations. So to start out, um, substructure, we talked about looking for these, uh, these little clumps of dark matter, um, if we can find them moving around the galaxy. Uh, and here's a picture of, or here's an image of uh, a bunch of stars in a stellar stream. So you can see the, the over density here in the middle is a stellar stream called GD1. Uh, there's an arrow here to what we think might be the progenitor. Uh, that's, the, that's the globular cluster uh, that started out before it got shredded into this very, very long stream of stars. Uh, and the interesting thing here is these gaps. Uh, these gaps, we think, could be an indicator of one of these um, subhalos, one of these, these clumps of dark matter kind of plowing through the stellar stream and moving the stars away that we thought should be here. Uh, it's plowed through and, and, and pulled the stars away so that we can't see them anymore, or they've, they've kind of moved to a different um, trajectory. In fact, this little spur here that's pulled out uh, could be the stars that started out here and were pulled out and, and moved to a different orbit by a passing um, subhalo of dark matter. So here's perhaps um, one of the first actual indicators of an interaction with dark matter that we're seeing in the scale of our own galaxy uh, in the Milky Way uh, in a stream that is in that is moving around um, the Milky Way. I should say this is not yet uh, confirmed as, as you know, we don't, we don't know for sure that this was dark matter. There are other reasons to believe there might be a gap um, and there are other ways to create this, but really this is, a, this is a very promising idea of how we could go about detecting the existence of this kind of substructure, which would again confirm one of the big predictions of our dark matter simulations. Uh, and here's, this is just uh, on, the, on the top here, this is the model of what we would expect a passing subhalo to do to an otherwise thin stream. You can see it's kind of pulling out uh, stars to different trajectories. Uh, and what, what, what they're showing here in the paper uh, is the idea that you have this little spur of stars, which exactly matches when uh, you, you might argue that this one here matches very closely what you see as kind of a bunch of stars pulled out to a different trajectory. Great, uh, hopefully I've convinced you all that this is good. Um, Next, we talked about the shape, right? We want to know what the shape of these dark matter halos is. Um, is it round? Is it is it is it squashed in a certain direction? Um, and again, here this is a great a great analogy to the wishing well. Is uh, is our wishing well perfectly round, or is it squashed in a certain direction? And can we model what the orbits of stars uh, will be uh, given that different shape? Um, so here's, for example, this this is a simulation done by a um, uh, someone I, I collaborate very closely with um, uh, called Sarah Pearson. She works uh, also in New York. Um, this is a simulation of, so the red points here are what a stellar stream called PAL5, Palomar 5, um, would look like in a galaxy if its dark matter halo were perfectly spherical, like this up here. Uh, and if you can look that kind of in the background here, you actually see this is the observed uh, structure of PAL5. So you can see it matches very nicely um, to the simulation that she made in a spherical halo. Well, let's see what happens to a stream in a triaxial halo. So when she tried to do this in a triaxial halo, 
the stream gets completely fanned out. Uh, and you actually, if this were the stream, you wouldn't even be able to see anywhere past kind of the dense part here because the stars would be mixed in with other stars um, in the galaxy in the halo. Um, so essentially this is kind of a smoking gun to say, well, the, the halo shouldn't really be triaxial. It should be spherical uh, because this is what our stream looks like, not at all this. So, and, and here's a simulation that I made as part of my work um, to show actually the difference between the two. So on the left, you see uh, the evolution of Palomar 5 in a spherical halo uh, versus this is this would be Palomar 5, uh, the, the stellar stream Palomar 5 in a triaxial halo. And I'll just point out uh, where things kind of start going awry. Um, so we're actually looking at a simulation of several billions of years, which is about the scale of how long we think Palomar 5 has evolved. And you can already see in the right-hand image here, uh, Palomar 5 is getting much more fanned out, whereas on the left, you have a very nice thin stream. Uh, and again, here's a great prediction uh, of what, uh, what we expect from a spherical configuration of dark matter versus a triaxial configuration on the right. And again, what we see is a thin stream. So what we're saying is uh, we actually believe dark matter halos, at least at the radius uh, of Palomar 5, should be, uh, or we could expect them probably to be more spherical than they are triaxial. Uh, this goes a little bit against actually the simulations of dark matter, um, but there are various ways to reconcile that. So it's not yet at all uh, a reason to not believe the simulations. Um, and in fact, current research says that this actually matches up very well with what we believe uh, dark matter would do uh, is create these thin streams. Very nice. So I just want to wrap up and say, uh, you know, I hope uh, I've shown you some great pictures of, of stellar streams and why they're important and why I love thinking of wishing wells as a way uh, to try to understand what dark matter is. Uh, our two heroes, Vera Rubin, Fritz Zwicky, uh, if we have a few more people with great ideas like them, uh, perhaps we'll get to an, either, an even fuller understanding of what dark matter is and what we have going on in our galaxy. And with that, I will stop. Um, I have no way to see questions, but hopefully uh, some of my friends here will uh, help share if there are any questions. Uh, you actually do. It's in the chat at the bottom. Uh, we oh, have one question. Phenomenal. A little while ago. It says, could our calculations of gravity just need to be modified to match orbital observations? Fantastic. That's a great question uh, for whoever submitted it. And uh, I say it's a great question because uh, many very uh, um, important and eminent physicists ask the same question. Um, I should say that the consensus currently in kind of what most physicists and astrophysicists believe uh, and are researching towards is the idea that dark matter is what is missing, um, that our calculations of gravity are correct and that the equations we use and the theories we believe are correct. Uh, and the only, the, only, the only problem is that we can't actually observe this dark matter, but that's not everybody. There are certainly people in the community uh, who have been pursuing this exact question of actually, what if our theory of gravity is wrong? Uh, what if the, the, the equations that govern how we calculate kind of how things move around are different? And especially the, what, are, what if they're different on these very large scales, right? So uh, we know for sure that everything works out very nicely in our solar system. Uh, we don't need to make any modifications. We don't need to invent any dark matter. It all works out beautifully. But uh, so maybe on the scale of galaxies or galaxy clusters, our equations of motion are incorrect. Um, or need to be modified. And, and the, the, the leading um, kind of alter, alternate theory is called uh, MOND, that's Modified Newtonian Dynamics. Uh, there's also MOG, Modified Gravity. Uh, and that's exactly what they do. They actually, they introduce different um, e equations, different constants or different uh, variables into the equation uh, to modify the equation so that the observations match up with uh, what the expectation is uh, from this modified theory without needing to invent something like dark matter. Um, again, I, that, that is not the consensus. I think the consensus is still with um, the idea of dark matter, but there are certainly people pursuing these kinds of ideas. OK. Uh, that's the only question I saw in here, uh, but I'll ask one myself. Uh, given that we're talking about galaxy clusters here, if you take uh, the example of our solar system where all the gravity is sort of concentrated where the sun is, so it's pretty simple to model. Could it be the case in a cluster where uh, the outer edges are also being affected by surrounding galaxies, that the other galaxies around are having an effect, uh, essentially pulling out 
even as the central black holes are pulling in. Yes. Um, now, again, I think that's that's very. So, the, if I'm understanding your question correctly, that is to say, you know, we're we're assuming that we're going to make a calculation based on the stuff we see, but there are there are galaxies here in the outskirts that might be pulling things away uh, in different velocities. That's uh, certainly something that needs to be taken to, into account in these calculations. Um, one convenient thing from Newton uh, is to say that if you have a relatively spherical uh, distribution. Uh, then the forces from the outside cancel each other out. So for example, if you've got, if you want to calculate what the force is on this galaxy, um, I would posit you only need to take into account the stuff in the very middle. And that's because you've got this galaxy here, but you've also got a bunch of galaxies all spread out on the other ends of the stuff that I've said you can exclude, and those forces more or less cancel out. Uh, you're absolutely right to say that they don't entirely. And you know, because I chose this galaxy, I think it's fair to say that it's probably feeling uh, a larger force from this big galaxy next to it than all the stuff that I said would cancel it out. Um, but that's a correction that is, you know, of order unity. It's not a correction of order 10 or 100, uh, which is the correction that we need to make. Uh, so yes, certainly these things need to be taken into account. Unfortunately, it's not quite enough to make up for what we see going on. Okay. Uh, can you see the chat window? I can. I, I, I've now discovered that I can. And... Well, you can see there are no more questions, Phenomenal. but uh, lots of applause for your talk. Well, thank you very much. This was a pleasure. I hope I didn't bore you all to death, and I hope you all uh, stay safe and have a great night after this. No, your enthusiasm is obvious, and it's a fantastic talk. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you again for inviting me. Yeah, if there are no more questions, I think we can wrap this up. And conclude until next month. Give it a second, see if anybody else has any questions. Anybody else out there want to ask any questions? No, oh, the queue is clear. Okay. All right, then. Let's call it a night. Yep. Thanks very much for coming. Right. Very good. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Good night. All right, the stream is ended.